Can you click broadcast. Excellent. All right. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Sorry, everyone, for the slight delay. Just give us one second, please. And you can go ahead and share your screen while I introduce you. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. We had some minor technical difficulties today, uh, but thank you for joining us. We are very excited to be discussing a new book, Constraining Dictatorship from Personalized Rule to Institutionalized Regimes with Anne Meng, who is Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of Virginia. Her work focuses on authoritarian politics, institutions, and elite power sharing. She has published articles on authoritarian ruling parties, term limit evasion, and leadership succession. She received her PhD in political science from the University of California, Berkeley, which is just down the street from us. Um, today, if you have any questions as she speaks, please enter them into the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. If you're a Stanford CDDRL affiliate and you're interested in unmuting to ask your question, please note that in the question itself so that I know. Um, and otherwise, we are very excited to welcome Anne. Anne, please go ahead. Awesome. Thank you so much, um, Didi, for that awesome introduction. Um, as she mentioned, I am from California, actually, and I, I spent 11 years in the Bay Area before coming to UVA. So it makes me happy to virtually pretend like I'm back in California today. Um, with all of you. So um, thank you so much C CDDRL for having me today. Um, and thank you so much for the audience for being here. Um, I, I know that time is super precious these days. Um, so I, I really appreciate that you're spending part of your day with me. Um, so um, as Dee mentioned, um, I'm really excited to be talking about my new book, um, Constraining Dictatorship, that uh, came out about six months ago. Um, and so what I'm gonna do before I get into my slides is I'm just gonna take a step back um, and just kind of give you an overview of the project. Um, so this is a project that thinks about the causes and consequences of autocratic regime institutionalization. Um, and the fundamental question we're gonna be thinking about today is how does executive power become institutionalized within dictatorships. So in other words, how do we go from a one person personalist dictatorship um, to becoming an institutionalized system that is governed by rules and procedures and structures that can undergo multiple peaceful leadership transitions. Um, we're gonna think both about how institutionalized forms of dictatorship emerge as well as whether formal institutions actually have any bite in dictatorships, right? So do, you know, do rules on paper even mean anything when we're thinking about authoritarian regimes? Um, specifically, the types of rules and institutions we're gonna be thinking about today are executive constraints. Um, so these are um, rules that kind of explicitly limit the leader's authority. So concrete examples include constitutional succession procedures or term limits. Um, basically, I'm interested in thinking about the rules that structure power at the highest um, levels of the regime. So entirely focused on the executive. Um, and the types of data that I'm gonna be talking about today are constitutional rules, as well as power sharing appointments in presidential cabinets. Um, okay, so why don't we kind of motivate some of these ideas by thinking about the following two cases. Um, so on one hand here, we have Sakutori, who was the first president of Guinea when Guinea gained independence in 1958. On the other hand here, um, we have Julius Nyerere, who was the first president of Tanzania when Tanzania gained independence in 1960. So when Guinea and Tanzania gained independence around 1960, these two regimes actually looked remarkably similar. Um, so namely, they all had, they both had parties, legislatures and elections. So in Guinea, uh, the ruling party was the PDG and in Tanzania, the ruling party was Tanu. Both of these cases um, had functioning legislatures that met on a yearly basis. And both of these regimes um, also had presidential and legislative elections that occurred on a routine basis every couple of years. Uh, moreover, both of these regimes are actually coded as dominant party regimes by the regime typologies framework um, that's kind of very frequently used in scholarship on authoritarian regimes. 
Okay. So on, you know, on paper, these two regimes looked very similar, right? So they both had the whole host of nominally democratic institutions, parties, legislatures, and elections that we've come to associate with autocratic regime stability. However, um, in the 1980s, the trajectory of these two regimes diverged tremendously. So in 1984, Secretary dies of a heart attack. And before succession plans could be finalized, the military takes over in a coup and immediately bans the ruling PDG party. On the other hand, in Tanzania, um, in 1984, Nairere voluntarily retires and hands power peacefully to his uh, constitutionally designated successor. And in fact, Tanzania has undergone several peaceful leadership transitions since then. And the initial regime that took power upon independence is actually still in power today. Okay, so that introduces the first puzzle of the book which is what explains differences in authoritarian regime outcomes if the presence of these nominally democratic institutions isn't explaining why some regimes fall and others survive, right? So both of these cases have the whole host of nominally democratic institutions, but why is it that the regime fell in Guinea but survived in Tanzania? So it turns out that if we take a closer look at the institutions of these two cases, in particular, if we take a closer look at the adoption of executive constraints, then some very important institutional differences emerge between these two cases. So in Guinea, Secretary was actually a very unconstrained president. Um, for instance, there was never a clear constitutional succession rule that was created that specified who the de facto successor would be if the president were to die or be incapacitated. Furthermore, within the cabinet, Secretary left um, several key cabinet positions vacant. So for instance, the office of the vice president was not filled about half of the time Secretary was in, was in power. Um, moreover, for the cabinet positions that he did fill, elites were rotated frequently. So there was a lot of elite shuffling within the cabinet and he never allowed one person to stay in one position for too long and he, because he wanted to avoid allowing any particular elite from amassing too much power within one position. Okay, so let's take a look at Tanzania now. So in Tanzania, um, a number of key executive constraints were adopted. So for instance, um, in 1977, when Nairere was still president, um, a constitutional rule was created that specified that the vice president is the constitutionally designated successor in the case of the president's death. Importantly, the vice president has always been appointed in Tanzania. So this position has never been left vacant and there's relative cabinet stability. So elites aren't shuffled um, very much and certainly not at the same rate that we saw in Guinea. So there's kind of relative cabinet stability. Okay, so now it seems like um, that the difference between these two cases is the adoption of executive constraints, right? And that explains why the regime was stable in Tanzania and why the regime died in Guinea. However, this now introduces a second puzzle for us to think about, which is um, why do some authoritarian leaders adopt executive constraints while others do not? So we're going to be thinking about both of these questions today. And the main premise of this book is that regime institutionalization is key to understanding patterns of autocratic durability. So what I mean by regime institutionalization is the creation of rules and structures that govern the distribution of power and resources within the ruling coalition. So in other words, just to put it more simply, I consider autocratic regimes that have executive constraints in place to be a, an institutionalized regime. And I consider an autocracy without very many executive constraints in place to be an example of one that is not institutionalized. 
Um, so this book is um, organized in, in kind of two main parts. So the first half of the book thinks about the causes of autocratic regime institutionalization. So here institutionalization is the dependent variable. And the main question here is why do some leaders uh, create constraints while others do not? So my argument here is that leaders who enter power initially weak are the ones who need to institutionalize in order to maintain support from other elites. However, there's kind of a path dependency flavor to this argument in that I argue that leaders have to make these institutional decisions when they first enter power, but these institutional decisions lock in and they shape what the regime looks like for the rest of the leader's tenure. So these first couple of years of the regime are really critical in kind of determining the regime's trajectory. Okay, so that's the first half of the book. So the second half of the book then thinks about the consequences of having constraints. Um, so as someone who studies autocratic institutions, a question that I get all the time is, okay, so you know, you've showed us that there's variation in the adoption of these constraints, um, but do these parchment institutions even mean anything in dictatorships, right? Like, does it even make a difference that we're seeing these constitutional rules be adopted? So that's actually exactly what I look at in the second half of the book. So in the second half of the book, I think about whether institutionalized regimes actually perform better on outcomes related to regime stability and leadership succession. So specifically the two outcomes related to regime stability that I look at um, are leader tenure and uh, vulnerability to coups. So the short answer to this question is yes, I do find that institutionalized regimes do perform better on all of these outcomes. However, we have to condition on the fact that these institutional decisions were endogenous in the first place. So this is where the second half of the book is very much informed by the first half of the book, right? So in the first half of the book, I established that weak leaders have to adopt constraints. Strong leaders can stay in power no matter what they do. Right. So what happens? So mo a lot of the existing literature actually hasn't conditioned on leader weakness and most existing empirical studies just put insta uh, just put regime outcomes on the right hand on the left hand side of the regression and institutions on the right hand side of the regression. But what happens when you do that without conditioning on leader strength is it actually underestimates the effect of institutions on outcomes because strong leaders can stay in power no matter what they do. So what I do is I look to see whether weak leaders who adopt constraints perform better compared with weak leaders who do not adopt constraints. And what I find is the answer is yes, weak leaders who adopt constraints end up having more stable regimes. Um, so what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is I'm actually going to focus most of my attention on part one. We're going to mostly be talking about the causes, um, but feel free to kind of ask me questions during the Q&A about part two, the consequences, and I'm always happy to, to talk more about it. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do for the rest of the time is um, I'm going to um, kind of uh, talk a little bit more about kind of the puzzle and, and what motivated this book. Um, I'm going to show you um, some cool data that I collected on autocratic, um, uh, on executive constraints and autocracies within sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and we're going to kind of talk through the theory of, of why some leaders adopt constraints and others not. Um, okay, so um, let's just kind of motivate the puzzle a little bit more. Uh, so the first thing that I really wanted to stress is that it's really hard being a dictator. Dictators are overthrown all of the time. And one of the main things we know from the existing literature is that leaders are most frequently deposed by their own regime elites, right? So autocrats are most frequently overthrown by their supposed friends. Um, coups make up the vast majority of non-constitutional exits from office. Um, so this is exactly the threat that we're going to be thinking about. The fact that leaders need to find a way to convince their own regime elites to not overthrow them. The second thing that I wanted to emphasize is that leadership succession is a huge challenge for autocracies. Um, so what we see in the graph here is um, 
It's just a histogram of the um, number of successful leadership transitions. Those are the bars above the zero axis. And then the number of violent leadership transitions, those are the bars below the zero axis um, in, in autocracies every year from 1946 onwards. So what we see from this graph is that about half of all leadership transitions do not occur peacefully, right? The, the problem of how to pass power from one leader to another is a fundamental challenge in dictatorships. One thing you might notice is that um, autocratic leadership transitions have gotten more peaceful since the end of the Cold War. And actually, um, my talk today will explain why we see this trend. Okay, so what do we currently know about regime stability? So I would say that one of the main arguments that's come out on the literature on authoritarian stability is that nominally democratic institutions, things like parties, legislatures, and elections promote authoritarian durability, right? So there's been a lot of literature written on this, and these are just some of the names that kind of come to mind right now. Um, however, I wanted to highlight two things here. So the first thing I wanted to stress is that nominally democratic institutions are actually really common in dictatorships. Most dictatorships have parties, legislatures, and constitutions. What this graph shows is the percentage of autocracies with a ruling party, with a constitution, and with a legislature from uh, the 1940s onward. The other thing I wanted to stress here is that the presence of nominally democratic institutions is also not just a post-Cold War phenomena, right? As we can see from the graph, these institutions were already incredibly common during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Um, the second thing that I wanted to highlight is that although we have a lot of scholarship talking about how ruling parties are a really important institution in promoting regime stability, um, what I wanted to emphasize here is that most ruling parties are actually not that strong. Um, what you see here is a histogram um, that shows the number of years the ruling party was able to remain in power past the death or departure of its founding leader. And as you can see, almost all of the observations are at zero, okay? Most ruling parties are unable to survive in power beyond the, the uh, lifespan of its first leader. So this suggests that most ruling parties are really not as organizationally strong or autonomous as we might think, right? Also, the fact that most of these parties are unable to survive the first leadership transition means that they're not able to regulate future leadership transitions, right? So although we have a lot of kind of seminal theories talking about the importance of ruling parties, when we look at the empirics, um, we should be careful in kind of extending those theories to most parties because most parties are really just not that strong. Okay, so taking a step back, um, something's not adding up then, right? Because we have this almost universal presence of nominally democratic institutions, but that can't explain variation in regime stability. Um, so I argue that there's two things going on. So empirically, I argue that we're looking in the wrong place, right? A lot of nominally democratic institutions, such as parties and legislatures, um, are probably kind of weaker than we might otherwise think. And so these institutions can't effectively tie the hands of leaders. So what I argue is that instead of assuming that a lot of these institutions are strong enough to constrain leaders, let's just look more directly at rules that govern the executive, right? Let's just look more explicitly at whether rules that explicitly limit presidential power exist or not. Um, so that's on the empirical side of things. On the theoretical side of things, I argue that we haven't actually specified a precise mechanism about how or why certain institutions provide credible commitment power in an authoritarian setting, right? Because if a dictator can just create an institution, why can't they just as easily remove it? So one thing that we're gonna be thinking a lot about today is what actually creates the micro foundations of credible commitment power for certain types of institutions. Um, let's see, do I have a question? 
Didi, I can't, I can't read the, the QA for some reason. Um, okay, that's okay. Um, okay, so um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about um, uh, my, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what my data looks like um, before I kind of talk about the theory some more. Um, so what I did was I collected original time series cross-sectional data um, from 1960 to 2010 from 46 authoritarian countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, that's pretty much all authoritarian uh, countries in Africa. Um, a couple of countries drop out in the 1990s because they democratized, um, but for the most part, all countries in sub-Saharan Africa are in the data set from independence um, onward. So I look at two types of constraints. So the first type of constraint is I look at kind of formal constitutional rules. And the two specific rules that I look at here are um, whether there are term limits in place and whether there is a constitutional rule specifying um, the kind of procedures around leadership succession. Um, so um, I think that, you know, the way that term limits kind of um, constrain presidents is a little bit more self-evident. So let me talk more specifically about the kind of logic behind leadership succession. So leader, the reason why leadership succession rules are actually an effective way to constrain the authority of leaders um, is because it basically identifies an alternative challenger. It identifies a focal point i.e. the successor, that effectively kind of challenges the one-man dictatorship of the president. When a president, um, when there is a constitutional succession rule in place and the president actually designates a successor, that person effectively kind of shares the spotlight with the leader. Um, a lot of leaders are actually quite afraid of the crown prince problem, the very fact that by naming a successor, you're effectively sharing the spotlight. And so a lot of presidents are actually um, afraid to designate successors for the very reason that it's actually kind of a power sharing device. Um, so that's kind of the logic behind why we can think of leadership succession rules as, as a way in which um, the, the kind of authority of presidents is constrained. Um, okay, the other type of um, executive constraints that I collected data on are kind of informal constraints. Um, so I here I look at the appointment of elites to key presidential cabinet positions. Um, specifically, I focus on two types of positions. So the first position is I focus on whether a vice president or prime minister was appointed. And I also take into account whether this appointment was stable. So whether the elite was kind of shuffled in this position or whether the same elite was able to remain in this position over a long period of time. Um, a really quick um, point of clarification about the vice president and prime minister position. Um, within authoritarian regimes in, in um, sub-Saharan Africa, these positions are effectively the same. They just kind of differ in the title. So think of the vice president and the prime minister position as kind of the number two position in the regime directly under the president. Um, all of these cases have either a vice president or a prime minister, but not both. Um, so they're just kind of different titles for the same position. Um, the other um, cabinet position that I look at is whether an elite was appointed to the defense minister position. Um, so the defense minister position is extremely important in not just African countries, but also in authoritarian regimes, precisely because it represents control over the military. And given that leaders were largely overthrown via coups, um, whether uh, authority is granted to another elite to control the military is a huge deal. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to specify here is um, making appointments, the fact that a leader would appoint an elite to the vice president position or the defense minister, that is not a trivial thing in an authoritarian regime. Leaders in autocracies very routinely leave these positions vacant. And in some really extreme examples, they will actually appoint themselves as their own vice president, or they will actually appoint themselves as their own defense minister. Um, in the most extreme example of my data set, um, there was one president that actually named himself to a third of all cabinet positions. So the fact that a, that a president may be willing to appoint another elite to these positions is not a trivial matter. 
Um, okay, so this is what the data looks like cross-sectionally. Um, so each circle here represents a, um, a different country in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, darker circles represent more institutionalized cases and lighter circles represent less institutionalized cases. Um, so I think that the big takeaway here from looking at these graphs is that this kind of old idea of African countries um, being kind of uniformly uninstitutionalized or this kind of notion that all, you know, that all African countries just have weak institutions is obviously empirically false, right? So what we see here is that there is a ton of variation cross-sectionally and um, there are a lot of differences across countries um, in terms of how institutionalized they are or not. Um, this is what the data looks like over time. So each line here um, represents um, the percentage of countries in my data set with each of these four dimensions of institutionalization um, from 1960 until 2010. Um, one of the kind of more obvious trends that jumps out here is that um, a lot of regimes became more institutionalized after the end of the Cold War, right? So actually this explains why leadership transitions became a lot more peaceful um, after the 1990s. So the one substantive point that I think um, my book can kind of speak to about African politics is I argue that the real story of Africa in the 1990s was not democratization. It was actually regime institutionalization. So elites recalibrated the political system to entrench their own power after the end of the Cold War. And so despite the fact that a lot of these countries implemented what we thought looked like democratic reforms, such as the introduction of multi-party elections, at the same time, they were putting in place these autocratic power sharing mechanisms that would also allow them to prolong and, and make their regimes more durable. So what I would argue is that the real story of Africa in the 1990s was the strengthening of authoritarian durability. And you know, even though my, my data focuses on Africa, I would argue that I think that this argument really applies to a lot of these third world, uh, I'm sorry, these third wave democracies, right? Alongside democratic reforms, these autocratic elites were also finding ways to institutionalize their power. Okay, so um, let's return to this question then of why some leaders adopt executive constraints while others do not. And as a follow up question, as I mentioned, we really want to think about the mechanism here, right? So how do institutions actually provide commitment power in dictatorships, which are kind of notoriously weakly institutionalized settings? So here's what I argue the mechanism is. So I argue that institutions credibly constrain dictators only when they actually change the underlying distribution of power between the leader and elites. And so what I argue is that power can be shifted by giving elites access to the state. So when elites are appointed to key government positions, they're given all of the resources, all of the material resources um, that are associated with the cabinet position. So they gain, so by gaining access to these material resources, as well as the power and prestige associated with the cabinet position, this then allows elites to consolidate their own basis of support. Um, the same kind of logic applies to constitutional rules that kind of regularize and codify elite access to government offices, right? So things like um, succession rules or term limits. Um, so the kind of main theoretical takeaway here is that institutions that actually empower specific challengers, that is what creates credible threats of rebellion. So I would say if I wanted to kind of try to summarize my theory in one sentence, it would be that institutions matter, not because they establish de jure rules, but when they actually affect de facto political power. Right, not all constitutional rules are equally effective. And what we really want to think about is whether a certain type of constitutional arrangement or whether the appointment of an elite to a certain cabinet position actually gives them the material resources they need to consolidate their own basis of support. Okay.
So now keeping the mechanism in mind, why don't we then think about the question of when do leaders actually institutionalize and why is it that some leaders institutionalize while others do not? So my main argument here is that leaders uh, institutionalize when they enter power initially weak and they are likely to be deposed at the start of their tenure. So already strong leaders do not face a credible threat of rebellion from elites. They're able to stay in power regardless of whether they institutionalize or not. And of course, these strong leaders will not have an, will not have an incentive to institutionalize because they don't want to share power with elites if they don't have to, right? Initially weak elites, do face a credible threat of, uh, of rebellion from elites. So in order to prevent being overthrown when they first come into power, they need to commit to power sharing in order to maintain support from regime elites. So that's why we see them implement things like constitutional succession rules, or this is why they would make appointments, elite appointments to these key cabinet positions because they're credible power sharing mechanisms that actually arm elites with these material resources. However, like I mentioned before, um, there's kind of a path dependency here, right? So these critical institutional decisions are being made at the start of the leader's tenure. So the kind of the distribution of power between the leader and, and elites is really what kind of decides what institutions get developed at the start of the regime, but these institutional decisions end up shaping the rest of their rule. So the one thing I wanted to stress here is that this is what we see reflected in the data. So empirically, um, I look at when most of these executive constraints were put in place. And I find that the majority of constraints are put into place within the first three to five years of the leader coming into power. So it does seem like empirically, most of these institutional decisions are being made early on. Um, okay, so I think what I'm going to do is, um, so I, um, so the book has a formal model, and this is the only slide on it. I'm just going to summarize the findings of the formal model. Um, I had a couple of slides showing some regression results, basically, but I'm just going to skip that, um, and I'll conclude, and we can kind of jump to the Q&A section, because um, I, I really enjoy kind of engaging with audience questions. Um, okay, so um, so I have a formal model in the book that kind of formalizes these interactions that I just summarized for us. Um, and basically what I find is that there are three basic types of autocratic regimes that emerge. So the one, the first type of regime is basically regimes that are not institutionalized. So these are circumstances where an initially strong leader does not institutionalize because this, you know, strongman leader simply doesn't have to. Um, there's kind of nothing elites can do about it. And this strongman leader is just able to stay in power for his entire lifetime, dis despite the fact that uh, he didn't institutionalize. So think of this as kind of a highly personalist regime. The one thing I wanted to caution here is that these types of regimes can often look stable when the leader is, when the personalist leader is in power, but these types of personalist regimes often die with the founding leader, precisely because they don't have mechanisms in place to govern leadership transitions. Okay, so that's the first type of regime. The second type of regime is um, regimes that do have institutionalization. So these are circumstances where an initially weak leader does have to institutionalize in order to stay in power. Um, and uh, this leader is able to stay in power because of this kind of bargain he has with other elites. And these type of regimes can also be really long lived, not because the leader was initially strong, but because the leader put in place these institutional mechanisms for regime durability. Um, so think of this as kind of institutionalized regimes that have a lot of rules and structures in place. Um, there is a third type of regime that I find, um, and this type of regime is, um, this is a situation where an initially weak leader um, is kind of so weak that they can't actually institutionalize enough to satisfy elites. So this is a leader 
um, who is kind of so weak that regardless of what they do, um, elites will just try to overthrow them. Um, and so th these are kind of conflict regimes where basically I argue these are regimes that we see last for only a couple of years and then they're kind of quickly overthrown in a coup. Um, so these are that that's kind of the third type of regime that emerges. Okay, uh, let's see, let's let's skip to the conclusion slide. Um, okay, so um, just to conclude, kind of taking a step back, um, I would say that the couple of takeaways um, I hope that you kind of remember from this talk is this kind of sentence that I think summarizes my theoretical argument, which is that institutions matter, not because they establish de jure rules, but when they affect de facto political power, right? It's whether institutions are actually changing the distribution of power and empowering specific elites. Um, I think the other important takeaway is that it's not about the existence of a democratic facade. Um, so, you know, almost all authoritarian regimes nowadays have parties and legislatures and elections and constitutions. Most dictators have kind of learned to speak the democratic language. Um, so I think that it's really important that we kind of look beyond this kind of check, these checklist items and look more critically at whether, you know, more explicit executive constraints exist that really actually tie the hand of the tie the hands of leaders more directly. Um, another big takeaway is, you know, I think kind of, um, you know, contrary to maybe the conventional um, narrative of, of Africa and the idea that Africa is all just kind of like strongman leaders um, who exist, you know, via patronage. Um, I think that what I show is that it's not all about big man politics and African autocracies. Um, we actually do see a lot of institutional variation in, um, in a lot of these countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is true even during the most authoritarian decades. Um, the final thing I wanted to say is um, I'm also happy to kind of talk a little bit about my new and ongoing work, which is actually um, focusing on the opposite of what this book is about. So while this book was all about how executive constraints get established, um, some of my ongoing work thinks about how executive constraints get removed. Um, so really kind of connecting this work to this ongoing literature on kind of democratic erosion. Um, and so I'm happy to kind of chat a little bit about that too. Um, okay, so I will stop screen share and um, I am uh, happy to kind of engage with the audience and, and take some questions. Great. Thank you so much, Anne for, Annie, for this fascinating uh, presentation and this great book. Um, I guess I'll kick off the questions with just a little more detail about the mechanisms. So you distinguish the executive uh, institutions that you identify as, as being critical for institutionalization as distinct from nominally democratic institutions, although the mechanism underlying some of that literature is similar in that it, is, it sometimes creates um, the ability to distribute some political power to the opposition or create a safety valve for, uh, you know, for dissent um, and different kinds of channels that can be monitored by the autocrat. So in what ways are the executive um, institutions that you identify so different from some of the nominally democratic institutions of, of the literature so far? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I think it's important to clarify that, so if we have a nominally democratic institution that actually is organizationally strong, right? So in one of the kind of rare cases, for instance, where a ruling party is strong, um, and you know, organizationally independent from the leader, um, you know, actually has influence over controlling material resources in the regime. I absolutely think that you know, a, a, an actual strong nominally democratic institution can constrain um, leaders and can tie the hands of leaders. This is actually more of an empirical argument, which is that you know, on the ground, a lot of nominally democratic institutions, especially in dictatorships are just not that organizationally independent of leaders, right? And the kind of empirical reality is that in a lot of these circumstances, um, ruling parties are really just, you know, kind of a mouthpiece for the leader or a mouthpiece for the regime. The leader is still calling all of the shots, right? The party really isn't deciding who gets what in the regime, right? And so it's more about, you know, really kind of trying to identify what types of rules and institutions 
actually dictate who gets what in the regime. And so what I argue is that when we're looking at kind of actual authoritarian regimes, it seems like things like cabinet appointments and rules that control executive power, they really are kind of the ones that are determining these power positions and where material resources are going. So it's not that nominally democratic institutions can't tie the hands of leaders. It's that we should really be sensitive to the fact that there's a lot of variation in the strength of these institutions. And so we just really need to keep in mind that a weak legislature or ruling party can't be as effective in, in kind of tying the hands of leaders. Okay, great. Thanks. So we have a question from Tom Finger here at Stanford, um, who's asking if performance, like economic growth, performance in providing public services like education or healthcare matter in the decisions by the elites to depose strongman leaders? Um, and what is it that the deposers want uh, power for? I'm sorry, can, can you repeat the question one more time? My internet cut out slightly. Of course. Does performance like economic performance or the distribution of public services like education or healthcare matter um, in decisions made either by elites or by deposers, people who depose elites? And mm -hmm. In the cases of coups that you that your research has uncovered, what is it that the deposers wanted when they assumed power? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I would say, um, so I would say coups. Well, so we know a couple of things from research on coups, right? Is that we often see that coups are linked um, to kind of um, we we tend to see coups in kind of poorer nations, right? We do see that kind of economic relationship. Um, it's a little bit hard to untangle that relationship because it could be that um, coups cause instability, which then is bad for the economy, right? So it's, you know, there's a lot of work being done trying to untangle that, but it is a little bit hard to untangle. Um, you know, what I do see in my research is that regime stability, um, you know, is sometimes linked to kind of economic growth and kind of slightly better outcomes as we would expect, right? It's kind of, you know, sometimes there's that story where it's like all good things kind of happen together. Um, it's a little bit hard to untangle the relationship though, right? Because it could very well be that, you know, regimes that enjoy stability then have more space to, um, you know, for, for like other good outcomes to happen. Um, in terms of what deposers kind of want, um, so, you know, I, I don't, I don't focus on, on coups. Um, I mean, I, I look at the conditions under which leaders try to kind of avoid coups, um, but I, I don't look as much as kind of incentives of coup plotters. Um, I mean, what we do know from existing work there, um, it, by, by Nanahil Singh is that, um, you know, in, in his research, um, most coup plotters actually aren't motivated. He argues that most coup plotters actually aren't motivated by kind of policy or concern over the regime. Um, and so it, it kind of seems like it's, it's, you know, often more about whether they can successfully overthrow the regime or not. Um, so there, um, I, my research is, is important in thinking about um, whether coup leaders can actually successfully overthrow the regime, because um, what I find and what I argue is that when leaders share power with would-be coup plotters who actually could overthrow them, then it's then these coup plotters are actually happier kind of being in the government and getting their share of rents as opposed to kind of trying to overthrow the government, right? So it's about kind of precisely buying off the people who would otherwise overthrow you. Um, but yeah, but otherwise, you know, I think that this relationship between kind of economic performance um, and institutionalization, it's, it's a great question. And I think we need a little more research to try to kind of untangle the effects. Okay, um, I'm gonna try to group some questions. Jim Fearon and our postdoc Nate Grubman are both asking about how exactly you conceive of and code of weakness in a leader. How do you recognize ex ante who's a strong leader and a weak leader at the moment that they assume power? Um, and that, you know, from your opening uh, illustrative puzzle, why is Nerere a relatively strong post-independence leader? Jim Fiorano is saying he would have thought that he was stronger than Torre, um, uh, or anyway, so how exactly did you make those choices? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so um, there's, there's a couple of ways that I coded leader, initial leader strength and weakness. Um, I actually think that this is one area that we need a lot more research on. Um, 
it, it's just like really hard to code leader the distribution of power, even though it's a variable that gets used in formal models all the time. Um, so I will be the first one to admit that my I don't think my measures are perfect. Um, but how I did it was I basically argued that the ways in which the leader comes into power um, is often kind of a good proxy for their relationship between the leader and the elites. Um, so for instance, um, I argue that um, founding leaders um, tend to be kind of much stronger than leaders that kind of came into power later, um, especially founding leaders that came into power immediately after independence, right? There's kind of this like initial excitement about independence. These founding leaders are often thought of like as, you know, the founding fathers of the regime. So they often enjoy a, a high levels of legitimacy um, and kind of extreme influence after coming into power. Um, so that's kind of one type of relationship that I look at. Um, the other type of relationship that I look at is I look at the subset of post-independence leaders. So I look at kind of the first leader um, after the country gains independence. So comparing Secretary against Julius Nyerere, for instance. Um, and there I argue that um, leaders that were um, kind of the leaders that were the kind of founders and main player and main leader of like a broad mass based independence movement um, tend to be much stronger upon coming into power compared with leaders that came into power because they effectively inherited their position through the outgoing colonial authorities. Um, so an example that I have in the book is I compare um, uh, Ufwe Boini, who was the first independence leader, the first post-independence leader in the Ivory Coast. Um, he was this like huge independence figure. He really spearheaded the independence movement in the Ivory Coast. So he's a much stronger leader compared with, for instance, um, if we think about the first leader in Cameroon, Ahijo, um, he essentially, um, you know, inherited his position from the outgoing French colonial authorities. And he was actually very unpopular when he first came into power because he was accurately perceived as kind of like a collaborator um, with the outgoing colonial authorities. Um, so so that those are kind of two ways in which I think about it. It's very much kind of, I look at how these leaders come into power. Um, you know, if we want to think about, um, you know, um, Sakatori being kind of an initially strong leader and, and Julius Nyerere being a weaker leader, you know, there I, I would say, so, so it's, you know, obviously there isn't one case that kind of works perfectly for every single aspect of the book. Um, there, I would argue that although both of these, both of those leaders were independents, um, kind of, you know, movement leaders. Um, Sec uh, Tory was more of like a one man machine and in Guinea, right? Like he actually, so Guinea was the only country that voted um, to completely severe ties, sever ties with France. And it was the only French colony to do so. And Secretary was basically kind of the single man behind that operation, right? Versus in Tanzania, um, Tanu was more of kind of like a it was, it, was, it was a group of elites that was kind of spearheading this independence movement. And so I would argue that in, by comparison, um, in Guinea, Secretary was more of like a singularly strong elite compared with um, Nairere in Tanzania. Um, yeah. Okay, and just a quick follow-up from David Layton. Is, are those coding decisions um, in the book in an appendix? Uh, yeah, that's right. So I talk about those coding decisions in more detail in the book. And there's actually a couple more ways that I try to code um, leader strength and weakness as well. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So next question is from Brett Carter, um, who's asking about post-Cold War Africa, in particular after the, um, in the claim that they've institutionalized their autocratic rule through these institutions. Given how thoroughly many of these autocrats resisted democratic reforms in the early 1990s and the dramatic spike in protests, around regular elections, um, is it possible that peaceful leadership transitions after the Cold War are instead driven by declines in military coups on the one hand, and also successful public and political protests by citizens on the other hand? Um, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Um, so I would, so I, I absolutely think that um, there definitely is something to say about the fact that protests became more kind of regularized and, and permissible um, in the post-Cold War world, right? And also there definitely is something to say about the fact that um, coups have just kind of lost a bit of legitimacy. Um, it's, it's just, 
a little less okay to kind of stage a coup and be very open about it nowadays. Although it, it definitely still happens all the time in Africa, right? Um, so I think what I would say about succession is that it's very much, um, it's very, it's very much kind of, despite the fact that kind of everyday people can protest, um, succession is still very much elite, like an elite coordination game, right? So, you know, ordinary people can go out and protest, but at the end of the day, regime elites still need to figure out who is the next in line and who is going to be the successor and, you know, whether everyone's going to be able to stay in power because we handle this transition well and peacefully and successfully, right? And so, you know, I think that um, the fact that there has been you know, I think that political liberal, the, the kind of increase of political liberalization um, in Sub-Saharan Africa in the 1990s was definitely driven by um, kind of openings on the ground and the ability of citizens to kind of voice their concerns more freely. But I think that at the end of the day, succession is still very much kind of an elite concern. Um, yeah. Okay. So following that, Kars Templeman is asking about uh, some work by Dan Slater, who argues that authoritarian institutions vary in strength across a different region, Asia, um, and says that founding leaders who face serious internal rebellion, especially typically leftist leaders, build strong counter-revolutionary, usually right-leaning ruling parties and other institutions. So that's why you get institutionalization in places like Malaysia, but not the Philippines. Do you, what do you think about this argument when applied to the universe of cases you're examining? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there, there's this kind of general, you know, there's this argument out there that when there's this like external threat, it, it kind of binds us as, as, you know, as elites, right? So my reaction to that is, um, so first of all, I think that that type of situation is empirically rare, right? So um, we don't see successful revolutions very frequently at all. In fact, revolutions, um, and kind of genuine kind of mass uprisings that genuinely threaten the regime um, are just empirically a lot more rare, right? And so um, what we see is that leaders are much more frequently deposed by other elites. So that's kind of the main cause of concern, right? Um, so I actually have some separate work um, looking a little bit more specifically at revolutionary regimes and regimes um, that kind of come into power um, via conflict. And so the main argument there is that um, the reason why we often, so actually um, my work on power sharing offers a slightly different argument for this observation that a lot of these kind of liberation regimes seem very stable. Um, so whereas a lot of the existing work argues that um, you know, we're just uh, elites bind these elites in these liberation regimes kind of bind together because we're fearful of this outside threat. Um, what I find in kind of separate work is that um, despite the fact that there is this kind of external threat, what we see in these liberation regimes is that there are high levels of power sharing, particularly along the defense position, right? So, so leaders are not just relying on this like fear of the outsider to stay in power. They are power sharing with elites, specifically coercive elites at significantly higher rates, which suggests to me that these leaders know that just the presence of an outside threat is not enough to bind us together, right? Um, so what I do find is that there are significantly higher levels of power sharing in these circumstances. So what I argue is that that is actually the kind of mechanism that's driving stability um, in a lot of these cases that, that Dan Slater is talking about. Okay. Um, and I guess in our final few minutes with you, I'd like to combine some questions and ask about um, whether or not there are cases in which weak leaders try to consolidate power or institutionalize, but then remove some of the constraints against them later um, or alternatively if some of the parties that that are in the data set have rules about how their leaders behave that also serve as constraints that are not institutional so that might just be more about either party specific rules or even about norms that govern um, autocratic leadership yeah um awesome so um let me talk about the second question first um so i mean you 
half of the constraints that I collect data on are essentially unofficial, right? So um, in, in these cases, there's no written down rules um, that, you know, tell a leader how to appoint their government or whether even to appoint a government, right? So these decisions to appoint elites to these key positions um, are effectively kind of informal, right? So I, so I definitely think about whether, um, you know, whether leaders are sharing power, not just through these kind of formal means, but not just through formal constitutional means, but also through these kind of informal mechanisms. Um, so yeah, I mean, I absolutely think that that happens. Um, and I actually think that these kind of, um, you know, these informal decisions that are not written on paper, a, you know, i.e. the decision to appoint a vice president or defense minister are often, um, you know, even more significant maybe than some rules on paper, right? Especially if norms governing the appointment of these positions um, are really key positions in government that come with a ton of material resources or whether that position controls the entire military, right? So, so yeah, I definitely, I definitely kind of think not just about parchment institutions, but things that are not written down. Um, so about the first question of institutional removal. Um, yeah, definitely. So, so that's um, what I'm kind of currently looking at with my kind of newer and ongoing um, research. Um, so what I have observed are, um, so I'll, I'll share kind of some of the, um, some of the more interesting empirical trends that I'm seeing. Um, so the first empirical trend that I'm seeing is that um, the way that institutions, that leaders are removing institutions now, um, is uh, they're, they've learned how to, to do them democratically, basically, right? So, um, you know, this idea that like a, a leader would just kind of like ignore the constitution or just like, you know, cross out a constitutional rule, we're really not seeing that happening. Um, so I have some work on term limit evasion. And so what I find is that almost all leaders are changing or removing term limits via constitutional motions, right? So leaders have gotten really smart about how to remove constraints on their power and they're doing so via these kind of legal constitutional mechanisms. Um, the second interesting thing that I have found is, um, so this is very preliminary and I need to finish coding the data for this, but um, what I'm seeing, um, at least so far, is that um, these kind of um, these kind of informal relationships that I talk about in this book, so whether the president appoints a vice president, um, this is actually really important in uh, determining whether the president can remove constitutional constraints. So for instance, I'm seeing some evidence that um, when a president has a constitutionally designated successor and that person is the vice president, the vice president is often the person that is that prevents the president from removing term limits. So that actually makes perfect sense, right? Because if I'm the vice president and I'm the next in line, um, and you try to remove term limits and basically you take away my, my ability to kind of be the next president, I'm gonna have a problem with that, right? And so I think it's really interesting that what I'm seeing at least preliminary um, evidence is that um, the kind of de facto power is actually really critical in determining whether constitutional rules are removed by leaders or kept in place. Um, the final interesting empirical thing that I'm seeing is um, I'm not, so despite the fact that, um, you know, a lot of literature on democratic erosion kind of got published 2016 and onward, and we all kind of started panicking after Donald Trump was elected, I don't actually see an uptick, a significant uptick in the level of um, democratic erosion or kind of the removal of constraints um, in the last couple of years. In fact, I argue that leaders have been learning how to do this for a really long time, since the 1990s. Um, along with implementing democratic reforms, these leaders were learning how to subvert these democratic reforms alongside having to implement them. So I'm actually seeing fairly stable trends over time and I don't see a significant uptick um, in you know, changes over institutions, whether adding or removal. Um, Oh, you know, I don't see a significant uptick in the last couple of years. Um, so it's kind of the third interesting finding so far. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Anne, for a wonderful talk. Thank you to our audience for joining us today. The book is Constraining Dictatorship. We hope that everyone has a chance to take a look at it. And Anne, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. I, I really enjoyed all the questions and the discussion. And, and thank you so much. Thanks. Bye.